we'll get things. So let's get started. Thank you, awesome. everybody. And Thomas, um, if you'd like to share your screen and get things started. Yeah, so I'll share in just a second. Um, I just wanted to say hello, everyone. Um, yeah, again, I'm Thomas Chamberlain. I think most of you have probably seen me. Um, I see some summer students here, so you all have obviously seen me every couple weeks in a different capacity. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about websites and databases and SQL and SQL injection. Um, so I can go ahead and share uh, so we can see the comic here. Um, so I shared this comic in the email that went around. So most of you have probably seen it already. Um, most of you have probably seen it before then. This is a very famous XKCD comic from 2007, I believe. Um, it's called Exploits of the Mom, and it describes a, uh, an SQL injection attack. So the, the sequence is basically that uh, the school calls this child's mother, says that they're having computer trouble, and asks if she really named her son this very strange sequence of characters, Robert, and then some symbols, drop table, students, and some symbols, which probably looks like gibberish to most of you, and that's okay. And then the school confirms that, in fact, uh, when they put that name into their database, it deleted a bunch of their student records. So that's kind of the end goal of the talk, is to describe how that might have happened. And, uh, we're going to be doing that via a website that I created for this demo, just to demonstrate uh, what this attack might look like. Um, I want to say up front that this is nothing that you can't find on the Wikipedia page for SQL injection or from any of you know dozens of explainers on this comic strip. Um, you know, this is all just on a server on my computer. There's not any penetration of any external systems or anything truly fun like that. But I'm hoping it will give you an idea of what this would look like in the real world. I think people have um, not a very fleshed out understanding of what hacking looks like in the real world. So this is a, a kind of fun example um, just to get your mind thinking about it. So I wanted to start with a, uh, trying to get everybody to have the same mental model of how a website works. So down at the bottom, I just made a little flow chart basically of a high level view of how going to websites works and what's happening. So this is you, uh, you are a box and you click things on your computer, specifically in your web browser, which is you know literally what I'm doing right at this very moment. The web browser communicates via the internet with some other computer usually multiple other computers, but for our purposes, it's just one. And that's called a server. There's a process running on that that's also called a server, just to be extra confusing. And that software process is receiving requests from your browser, and it's probably making many queries to multiple databases. If it's a complicated website, um, like Google or you know Facebook, then there's going to be a number of databases that it's doing queries in. It's requesting data about you so that it can customize the things that it shows you. Um, you know, it knows how many times you've logged in before. It knows what searches you've done before, so it can give you auto completions and things like that. Uh, the server process is going to take the results of those queries and formulate some sort of response that goes back through the internet to your computer. You see it in your browser with your eyeballs. So that's the rough round trip of how websites work generally. And I wanted to kind of start from a very simple slate. So we make sure everyone stays on the same page. So I want to show you something that's actually not a website, but kind of looks like a website. So this is actually just a file on my computer. It's just a text file that contains these words. You can load that into a web browser just fine. But you can see that when I refresh the page, um, this network activity graph over here, which I'll explain in just a moment, doesn't show anything. And that's because it's not actually loading anything from the network. It's just looking directly at my hard drive. So that's not a website. So we can get that out of the way. This is a very simple website here. Um, you've probably seen some person's, uh, you know, tilde homepage on the NRAO network. This is mine. This is a specific URL on my web page. 
And all it says is, hey, this is a website. Um, again, very simple, but we can see that on this web page, when I refresh it, it's actually doing what's called a git. So my web browser is requesting from this server, whatever process is running at this server, it's requesting this path. And we can see that in these dev tools in this area. So in the git, we're saying, hey, I'm talking to this host and I'm asking for this file name. And it's up to the server how to respond to that. In this case, it chooses to respond with that file, literally, just off of the disk. It doesn't do any manipulation to the file. It doesn't do any queries in a database. It just gets it and it's rendered in my web browser. So uh, that's not very interesting, but that is how the very early internet worked almost exclusively. There was a time before databases, before logging in, before all this crazy interactivity that we have now, where it basically worked like this. And you might have something like this structure. This is just the index of all the files in my homepage on NRAO. And this is a specific one that we're looking at here. Uh, there's no ability to log in. There's no ability for anyone to see something different depending on who they are and what role they have. Um, so to accommodate those use cases, um, you needed a bit more complexity and you needed more code to be running on the server to give you different results. And now I'm going to show you a slightly more complicated website and I'm going to show you how I built it. So um, first of all, let me make sure I'm running the right thing. So this is a very, very simple website written in Python. It's using a framework called Bottle. And all it does is register one route. So this is basically saying whatever request is sent to the root path of this URL, um, return this is the response, just hello world. So if we run this server and I go back to my browser and I refresh this page, we will indeed see hello world because we sent one request to the root of the server that's running in Python right in here. And it responded with that file. So this is on the server side. You can see that it says it got a git. So this was the request and it sent back a 200 status code and presumably the file. And that's why we see in our browser and our client that text. Cool. So that's easy enough. Um, what if we wanted to make it slightly more complicated? So what if we wanted to be able to put students into a database, for example? How might we do that? So this is a slightly more complicated website where, again, we just have one route. It's just the index. And then we're doing some filtering based off of something that I'll explain in a second. And then we're rendering an HTML template, which looks like this. It's a little bit scary. Um, I don't expect you to absorb all of this, but the result of that is this web page. So now we have a student's dashboard and we have the ability to add students. And now they appear right here in the student's table. And how did that work? So first of all, we made a get to that root URL um, right here. And that's what rendered the whole page. And then when we hit the add student button and put in our first and last name there, we did a post. So a git is typically used to request information from a website and a post is typically used to create some object in a database on a website. So in this case, when we did the post, we requested that a first and last name of Thomas and Chamberlain be sent to the, the web server and then it interpreted that, interpreted that as, okay, I'm going to add those things to a database. Now, it's not really much of a database. It's literally just a variable. And it's a list of lists. It looks something like this as we add people. So a list where the first item is Thomas Chamberlain. And then the second item would be something else if I added another one. And that's it. Uh, we also have the ability to filter. So like if I put T, like search for all students that start with T, then I would show up there. If I put F, then nothing would show up. 
because nothing matches that. Uh, and those are using Git requests because they're not actually changing anything on the server. They're just uh, requesting a query to be done. But this has a big limitation. So um, if we stop and restart that server and then refresh the page, then our students are gone. So Thomas Chamberlain is no longer a student. And it's gone because that database was never actually written to a disk, to any sort of long-term storage. It was just in memory. And as soon as the web server process was restarted, that disappeared. So the third example um, is slightly more complicated. This is a database that's literally just a CSV file. And this is what the CSV file looks like right now. Just one name, Fred Frederson. So it's uh, first name, comma, last name. That's the format of a CSV file. And so we have two functions that read and write to that file. We don't need to talk about how those work. But again, we just have our one route on the or a function for the index route. And now, instead of reading and writing to a variable in memory, um, it's going to read and write to a variable on disk. And just to demonstrate that really quickly, if I request, uh, if I refresh the page again, and I put Thomas Chamberlain in here, and I add student, then now, in addition to Fred Frederson, we have Thomas Chamberlain. And additionally, if we stop and restart that server, when we refresh the page, everything is still there. Because we've made a very, very simple database that stores this tabular information. Um, another view of that that you're probably more familiar with is an Excel file. So if I reload that CSV file in Excel, this is actually um, Office or uh, Calc, then you'll see Fred Frederson and Thomas Chamberlain, and it looks like you know nice tabular data. So that would be like another view into that data. So that's my whirlwind tour of how websites work and what a very simple one might look like. And before I get into more complicated queries on a proper database that's actually using SQL, I was going to pause for questions because I really am not entirely sure who my audience is. So if anyone has questions, feel free to ask now. Don't be shy. If any of that didn't make sense or if I was unclear about anything, I know it's probably a lot for some folks all at once, but yeah, feel free to ask real quick. Cool. All right. Well, I will just assume that made perfect sense to everyone, and I'm going to keep on moving. So um, let's look at a website that has a database behind it, and it's a little bit more complicated. And this example is going to form the basis for our um, SQL injection attack. And the comic strip will start to make a little more sense. So I am going to run that server here and we'll go back to this site and open up our dev tools again so we can see requests so this website uh, does basically two things it has a very basic authentication system so if we try to view students it's going to ask us to log in we don't have permissions to view all the students because we haven't logged in yet so i will log in and I will log in as Thomas, and uh, my password is just password1, I think. And I just have this showing in plain text so we can all see what's going on. Obviously, on a real website, this would be blocked out. So I will go ahead and submit that. And it says, cool, the login was successful. Welcome, Thomas. The other thing that I have this website set up to do is show the queries that are actually being done on the database. So. There was just one query that was done here, and it probably looks a little strange if you haven't looked at SQL before, but it's quite simple. Um, we're selecting three columns, an ID, a username, and a password from a users table where the username must match the string Thomas exactly, and the password must equal password one exactly. And there was one match to that, and so this query says, yes, you can sign in. 
Now, if I logged out and I said, I tried to view students again, and I said Thomas, but I gave the wrong password, then it would say, you can't log in because the username or password uh, is incorrect or the user just doesn't exist. We don't exactly know what the issue was. Obviously in this case, we know that the Thomas user does exist because we just logged in as me, but otherwise we wouldn't necessarily know. So I'll log back in and now we can actually view the students. So uh, there are 1000 students that I've put in this database. These are just randomly generated by a script. These are not real people uh, or real credit card numbers. Um, why they're storing credit card information along with the students, I don't know. Um, I guess just to make this talk a little more interesting. And here we can see that there's one query being done and it's actually fetching four columns. So it's grabbing the ID, the first name, the last name and card info, which is just a credit card number from the students table. And then it's ordering them in reverse order by ID. So it starts with a thousand and you end up down at number one here. And it will happily let us add a user with some credit card number and it goes in, no problem, no issues at all. And if instead we enter a very strange string in to last name that looks like this, then when I add student, we are gonna get an error. Um, oh, I might have actually messed up my SQL injection. Yeah, we gotta say drop table students. There we go. So now that I've typed it incorrectly, uh, we get an error. So it executed this query, um, which gave us an error. And the error says relation students does not exist. And that's bad. That means that the entire student's database is now gone. So just like in the comic strip, all of the student records have disappeared simply because we added someone with a strange name. And we can actually see the query that took place here. And it says insert into students um, these three columns with these three values and then drop table students. So how did we get there? So I'm gonna back up and I wanna talk about um, three aspects of queries uh, in an interactive shell. So I've made a little script here that's called explain SQL injection. And it has a function that adds a student to the database. So this is just like what we saw in the website. Um, and you don't have to understand all this, but this is uh, you know, where the magic happens. This is where we actually do the insert, just like that query that we saw a second ago. And we're doing one call. We're saying add student Thomas Chamberlain, basically the same thing that I just put in. So, uh, oh, we got an error because I have to bring our database back. Okay. So I put the database back the way it was before. And when I load this script, it executes a single query, just like we saw before. And it says there's a newly added, added student number 1001. Um, so if I wanted to um, do that again, like, so this is what that would look like. Uh, we can see a strange behavior happen if we say Thomas O. Chamberlain with a single quote here and we hit enter. Uh, it doesn't work. Now you would think that should work because it's just a name, um, but it doesn't. It says that's a syntax error. And the reason it's a syntax error can be seen right here. So it says, hey, there's a syntax error at or near this token. And it has a helpful arrow here that's basically saying, here is where the error starts. And what it's basically saying is everything up until this point is completely fine. But everything after that doesn't make sense. It expected some other token than a C right here. And we can kind of see from the highlighting that that is because that single quote actually closes the string right here. So O is now the whole string and it actually expects to see a parenthesis right there, but it doesn't. And so that's a syntax error. So if you've ever wondered why um, this isn't too common anymore, 
But if you've ever wondered why you've seen in a website, usually an older one, um, some behavior where it says you can't put that character into your name um, or to your username or whatever, this is probably why. It's probably because they have a poorly behaved web server that is not properly handling dangerous characters like that. And so to avoid errors, they're just blocking you from putting single quotes in or something like that. If you've ever seen a system that just strips out single quotes, that's probably why. So there are easy ways around that that I'll talk about at the end. But simply by seeing that error in this website, even if we didn't already know there were an injection possibility, that kind of tells us, hey, something really dangerous is going on because that behavior should not be possible. And to try to understand better how to exploit that, uh, we need to understand two things about SQL. So the first, and actually let me just show you this in, um, a different shell. So this is just a direct shell into the database. So I could say something like select everything from students and just get the first 10. And this would get us a table of all of that information. Now, an important thing to understand is that in SQL, things are terminated by a semicolon. So we could actually say um, this, and both of these statements are going to get executed, even though this is just one line of input into the database shell. So if I hit enter, we're actually going to see that first, this one gets executed, and then uh, this one gets executed. And the third thing we need to know is that if instead of uh, this query, we had two dashes, that is how you start a comment in SQL syntax. And that basically means that everything from here after is completely ignored by SQL. And so here we only get one query, even though it mostly looks like two queries, this one never gets executed at all. And so using those three things, we can actually exploit the vulnerability in the web server to say, um, instead of, oh, Chamberlain, um, what if I were to make this valid syntax, right? So if I said this, um, and then I added a semicolon, then we would see this is another error. But again, everything up to that point is valid. So then we just have to get rid of this somehow. So how can we make this valid syntax? And we can do that by adding a comment character. And so now we have added a new student that's just named O and everything else is ignored. And that's not very useful, but if instead of um, just commenting out the rest of the string, we said drop table students here, then now we have two queries and they are both gonna get executed. It's going to say insert into students, which it does, but then it's immediately going to drop the entire table, delete the entire table. And then the third statement is just a comment. And then we get an error because I'm trying to fetch all the students again and it doesn't work. So that is my overview of how SQL injection works. Um, and so if we go back to that comic strip, if I bring my server back, then hopefully that makes a little more sense. And I'll pause again for questions in case anybody has them. And then I was going to go through a couple more examples of more interesting ways that you might exploit something like this. Cool. All right. So, um, what if we didn't know that? Well, what if we didn't know my password? Right? What if we didn't know that the password for the user Thomas is password one? 
um, is there any way that we could log into this website anyway? Um, so if we said we wanted to log in as admin and we said, uh, you know, we just guess a password, then it's not going to work because that's not their password. We don't know what the password is. Um, but there's actually a way, because this login form is also vulnerable to SQL injection, which we can see because we get a syntax error here. Um, oh, no, that's, a, that's an error in my code. All right, well, hopefully that's not important. Um, if we say uh, this syntax, if we said one equals one or um actually what is it hand maybe this is better we'll just see one equals oh no what have i done hmm might have broken it This is what you get for messing with stuff five minutes before the talk. All right. Maybe we'll have to cut that short. All right. Um, I guess I'll just pause for questions here. I'll try to mess around and see if I can resurrect it. I was hoping to show you one more thing, but it is not behaving. So I'll just take questions and then if, um, if I can resurrect it, then we can show again what's going on. Um, <clears throat> Thomas, you in, in the first example, um, you had a comment in there, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the two statements that were executed, the drop table was in the second statement. Why do you even need the comment for the last part? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, because the, uh, it's just because of the way this, the string interpolation works. So, I look at the desktop again, and we look at how the query is actually constructed. When I say insert into students these values, uh, you'll see that there is always going to be a parenthesis at the end. So no matter what values, these are the values that I can control is right here and right here and right here. And this is where that exploit was taking place. So I have to, it's actually these two characters. These are always gonna be there. And I have to somehow make this valid syntax, even though these are gonna be inserted. And so I can just completely ignore them by putting that comment character there. And if it weren't there, it would be a syntax error and nothing would execute. That makes sense. Yeah, okay, I, I, I see that, thanks. Yeah. So I had a question, Thomas, about sure. um, prevention. So like you said, uh, these sorts of, if, of trivial problems about like, you know, someone named, you know, uh, with an apostrophe or uh, similar things don't tend to happen in modern websites because they're, they're sanitizing their input. They're making sure you're not naming someone drop tables mm -hmm. um, or credit card numbers are you know, actual valid credit card numbers. Uh, it's like you, you put in three uh, pound signs, which obviously is, isn't a valid number. Um, are there easy tools that say software developers can use uh, that you would recommend to do this kind of basic 
input sanitization so that I'm not running the risk of developing my own filter for valid you know, names and yeah. screwing it up? Yeah, so another good question. So um, what the way that this is handled now is actually not through sanitization. Um, historically, that was a very common method of handling this. So if you got a single quote, you would make sure to um, you know, sanitize it or escape that value somehow so that instead of being a, a single quote, uh, it's represented safely in the database. But if you approach it from that direction, you have to think of every single possible corner case and it gets very, very difficult. So the method that's more common now would be called um, parameterization, where instead of doing any sort of string concatenation at all, you just are supplying your um, your variables as parameters to the query constructor. And I'll show you that in just a second. Um, I just wanted to see if I could resurrect my database. We'll see. So Thomas, even if you can't necessarily get the, the database working again, yeah. would it be possible to just uh, give us a sort of a visual idea um, from the back end of your code, what you were going to try and perform? Yeah, so I did actually get it working. So let me share my screen again. Um, and then this will all make more sense, I hope. So let's see. OK. So I just kind of forgotten the syntax. So let me recreate the database since I had dropped it again. Um, so if I go to view students and I restart the uh, server and it asks me to log in again. So let's try to log in as the admin. And we're first going to just do this as our password. So when we hit login, interesting, huh? I'm not sure one was working, but not the other. So that's an example of basically how to log in without actually supplying a password. So because of the way that the SQL uh, injection attack works here, um, instead of checking against a password, we've actually constructed a query that says select stuff from the database where the username is equal to admin and the password is equal to nothing. So this whole statement evaluates to false because while there is the user named admin, their password is not blank. But even though this is true, we've then said, or all of this. So false or true and true, which all evaluates to true and allows us to log in as the admin user and do dangerous admin stuff. So that was going to be my example of, you know, um, you know, basically like a very simple example of hacking, of, of penetrating a website, uh, penetrating its authentication system. So this would obviously never work in the real world, but in this website it does because it's constructed in a very poor manner. So then to better explain how to prevent this, um, if we actually go into the code, um, the way that we were doing the adding of students and the, add, and the logging in was using these bad methods. And so we can change those to be good. And it's that simple. So uh, where's the other one? If we change this to login good, then now, as long as nothing else goes wrong, we will be able to refresh this. And when I go to log in, I'll log in as me again. We can say Thomas and password one. And when we go to view students, we should now be able to put any um, crazy thing in here that we want. And it will work. 
So now we literally do have a, a person named this. And the reason that works is because um, we have properly parameterized our inputs. So the query ends up looking like this. So it's not really that distinct from what Dane was talking about, about sanitizing. It's just, it's properly escaping our inputs for us. So you can see that this is our first name, but then this whole thing is students, even though um, it has an, an, uh, a single quote in it. So by putting another single quote in front of it, that's how you can um, escape this basically, how to make it, make it non-functional, but still go into the database properly. And then the card, card info is just this string. And so that goes in just fine. And the difference between the two approaches is that in the bad approach, we're literally just concatenating strings together, um, or this is a, a, a filter or a, a format string. So we're just inserting the username and password directly in here, or for the, the student, we're inputting card info, first name, last name. And instead of doing that, we just put these uh, parameters in here. We say, this is going to be a string, this is going to be a string, this is going to be a string. And then, hey, database query maker thing, uh, when you go to execute this query, supply these as the parameters. And then it's going to handle all of the uh, sanitizing and parameterization of those inputs for us. So that's the example of the proper way to do this sort of thing, if that makes sense. Cool. All right, so anybody else? Tapazi had one in the chat a while back that I guess I can read. Um, she asked, is the database in the previous example written on the server computer? Um, I don't exactly know which example that was referring to, but everything that was written to anywhere was written just to my laptop. So everything is just taking place on my laptop for this example. Nothing is, is leaving my computer or going over the internet anywhere. Um, but it would work exactly the same if my browser were on this computer and the server were running somewhere else. It would just be a different URL. All right, well, Thomas, I had a, a quick question about your, um, your attempt at hacking. Um, so what I'm, I'm curious about is how, uh, aside from the fact that you know how the code was written in the first place, how do you know to come up with this, that system that yeah. will pr produce the false or true statement? Because that seems to require some understanding of um, how the, how those values are being stored. Um, is that simply because of the simplicity of SQL that you're using or? So it's just a lot of guesswork. Um, the way that this attack would actually work in real life, you, you would call this uh, like a blind SQL attack if it were on a real website in that you can't actually see the results of your queries and you can't see the queries that are being performed. So on this website, obviously I'm showing you all the queries, which makes it incredibly easy to guess what's going on. It tells you which table it's querying. It tells you exactly what it's doing. In the real world, you would basically be relying on the fact that there is very often a users table that is called users. And simply by putting um, single quotes or other strange symbols into various inputs on the website, if you get errors back, then that's a really good indicator that something bad is going on on the server. And so there's actually automated tools that will do this for you. And this is how modern SQL attacks are done. Um, you basically just, just you know, spam a bunch of uh, forms on a website with a bunch of different potential SQL attack vectors. And if you get anything back, any, re any responses back that seem suspicious, then you know, hey, maybe I should focus my efforts more on this website and start trying to guess what syntax might actually work here. So you're trying to reverse engineer what the template of the query might be so that you can solve the puzzle essentially. And it was obviously trivial since I knew what the template was. Um, it's way harder in real life to come up with something like this, uh, but it does still happen on a regular basis. So uh, just last year, um, I think the last big one was Gab actually, which is a uh, competitor of sorts to Twitter that was hacked via SQL injection 
uh, I think late last year, early this year. Um, and that was, I think, the last one that I remember seeing. So it does still happen. It's not something, you know, from 20 years ago. Uh, it's very easy to be lazy when you're programming a website and construct statements in the wrong way and um, become vulnerable to this. So as part of why I wanted to give the talk, uh, so just, you know, if you see something bad, um, you know, say something about it uh, and we can fix it. But hopefully all our websites are behaving correctly. <laughs> right. And presumably something as simple as parameterizing the inputs mm -hmm. nullifies that sort of yeah. attack. Yeah. Any modern web framework that anyone is going to be using. So all the stuff that we use to make our websites is doing this automatically. And you have to try pretty hard to mess up uh, in this way. So this is a pretty hard attack to fall victim to. It does still happen, but um, it's very, very, very easy to avoid. Thanks. All right, well, um, does anyone else have any last questions for Thomas? We have a few minutes still. I want to say what mine is a question, but a request. Could Thomas what share that piece of code through uh, GitHub? Because that seems like a you know fun thing to work, to plug around with. Yeah, I can I can I can uh, I can send a link to that and to some other um, more thorough explainers of the concept. There's a great page that explains you know the specific SQL that's in the um, the comic strip and other websites that do similar things. You know, there's a very common exercise in college coursework. So there's other examples too that I can pass along. Thanks. Yep. Hey Thomas, um, I, from what I could see you were doing, you did things both ways and it didn't work one way. So when you had one equals one and admin, you know, username equals admin, yep. why did you need to the and statement? So you actually don't, and I'm not sure what was going wrong. Um, I think I might be off by one single quote there. The, the error that we were seeing was actually, um, <laughs> it was an error in the logic that I was using to display the errors that were happening on the server. <laughs> so it was like a meta error uh, that I just didn't notice. So that was not actually an error from the database um, exactly. It was uh, well, my own fault. But well, it would work without that and. You do need the and to log in as a specific user. And that's what I was hoping to demonstrate. So if you don't have that and statement, okay. it's actually going to match every row because it's just going to evaluate to true for every single row. And then the logic for the site basically says just grab the first result. So it's going to log you in as the user that is in the database first, which was someone named Rosa, I think, in our case. Um, and then I was going to say, if you wanted to log in as a specific user, you would need this extra and to force it to select the row that you want. OK, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. All right. All right, we do have one last question uh, in the chat. Um, if you'd like to read it out loud. Uh, yeah, sure. So Allison asks, uh, is there a way to launch a successful SQL-based attack if the inputs are properly sanitized or parameterized or whatever? Um, or would you just use a different approach in that case? So um, my understanding, and I'm not an expert in this field, certainly, but my understanding is that as long as things are properly parameterized and there's no bugs in the library that you're using that allow some exploit in this area, then there is no possibility of an SQL-based attack, at least in this specific way. So I guess in those cases, if someone really wanted to hack into a website, they would choose you know, one of countless other methods that are not this to try to uh, pursue that with. All right, anybody else? All right, then with that, um, I wanna say thank you very much, Thomas. This was super enlightening. Um, cool. Something that seems we all you know, use effectively on our, in a daily basis, but don't necessarily understand what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So that's very good to know and to be aware of if ever we hope to make our own very simple websites. Um, don't cut corners, it seems, is the- Yeah, talk, talk to me first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, thanks everyone.
All right. So yes, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for attending. And I'll see you all next week. Sounds good.